Are you ready to overcome the complexities and burdens that come with your success? Join the team at Centura Wealth Advisory in the Live Life Liberated podcast. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to Live Life Liberated with the team from Centura Wealth Advisory. Today, Derek Myron is in the hot seat. Derek, how are you? I'm doing well, Eric. How are you doing? Man, I am fantastic. I'm so excited. I think this is, correct me if I'm wrong, this might be your first international podcast. I think it's the second, this is the second time that this individual has come back to the show. Really? Uh, and I think the last time he was abroad when uh, when we had him on. Nice. All right. Well, that's fantastic. Who'd you bring back on? Manu Ricky, who's the partner at Grow X Ventures. Welcome, Manu. Thank you, Derek. Uh, a very good morning to you and to Eric. Yeah, welcome back. It, uh, it was September 11th, 2020 was the last time you were on the show. And thank you for making time out of your beautiful, your busy, busy day to come spend some time with us. Thank you. Your time just flies. Uh, it's been a while since I came. And thank you for inviting me over again. Great. So what um, the, the title of the show is the, the current early stage private equity VC investment opportunities in India. And the audience who should listen to this are ultra high net worth individuals and families seeking diversified early stage VC investments outside of the U.S. market and the professional advisors who serve these clients. I think all of those folks would be uh, well served to listen to this podcast. So, Manu, why don't you give a little bit of background about yourself and GrowX and what you've been up to since September 2020? Thank you, Derek. My name is Manu Riki. I'm a partner with GrowX Ventures. GrowX is an early stage VC fund. We are focused on B2B businesses with a preference for deep tech. We, we come in typically at uh, seed stage op- opportunities when the business is still at an idea stage and is being I- deliberated amongst the founders. And we partner with them since that stage and start handholding them to grow and build on their business. Since 2020, we've been building a portfolio. We now have about 16 companies spread across uh, deep tech ventures. When we say deep tech, we mean companies that are targeting space tech as a sector, companies that are building businesses in robotics or electric vehicles. Uh, So that forms one part of our portfolio. And the other is a uh, set of companies that are tech first, tech led businesses where we focus on companies that are trying to disrupt the financial services or insurance businesses. We, we also have some companies that are HR tech businesses. Uh, we're also looking at healthcare and life sciences as a sector with keen interest as we feel that that's ripe for disruption and newer uh, businesses will emerge that will solve some of the present and uh, large problems that the world faces from disease to hunger you know, to climate change. So lots of different opportunities. I got into the financial services business in 1998. And in 1998, there were 5,000 publicly traded companies. And today, in the US, there's 3,000 publicly traded companies. And folks, the businesses are staying private longer. The infrastructure is way completely built out. The access to capital, previously, people were just go to, to They would want to go IPO to get access to capital. Now that capital has really pursuing those opportunities much earlier in the private markets. And we find that many, many clients that we need to dig deep to go after and find these private opportunities, whether it be in private credit, private real estate, private equity, hedge fund, we have to spend more time on due diligence and going and finding those opportunities which is very true for also what's happening in India. And can you kind of just tell us what's going on in India on the ground and why is it such an attractive place to invest today? Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things that we've always said in India is that when you compare availability of capital in India for the, with the rest of the world, you find that in more developed markets, capital is always chasing good ideas. Whereas in India, for the last 40 years, ideas were always chasing capital. We've seen that balance shift in the last three to five years, and and I think this is going to shift more in favors of favor of entrepreneurs than ever before. You're right. You know now, if you look at most valuable companies around the world, they're privately held rather than publicly traded, 
and and there are two factors that I think that play into that. One, I think private markets are better suited for innovation. Um, the minute we become a publicly traded firm, our focus, no matter how much we want to avoid, still shifts into near term quarterly earnings, and and that cycle starts. It becomes very hard to invest in technology that will create long term value. Whereas in the private sector, everybody understands uh, that the real value can only be generated over longer periods of time, and you have to be patient to unlock that value and, and capitalize on that for yourselves as investors and as founders. And I think the other is just the abundance of liquidity in the private market. So like you said earlier, no matter where you were in the world, you had very few sources of capital available, and public markets were the obvious large pools where you'd need to go dip into Today, all that's changed. There is there is very large private pool of capital available, which is patient in nature, which is more strategic and better aligned with the uh, needs and objectives of entrepreneurs. And therefore, you see companies staying private, creating a lot of wealth. And many companies are now decathons. You know, earlier we used to celebrate when a company would become a unicorn. Now, even decathon isn't a, a surprise anymore. Right? It's becoming more a norm. Can you give us a definition of both a unicorn and a decacorn? Yeah, so a unicorn is a company that's valued over a billion dollars, and a decacorn is a company that's valued over ten billion dollars. And, and you see, just last year, if you look at India, some forty-two companies achieved a billion-dollar mark. Right, that's two to three times what has been historic average of last three years. Indian businesses attracted, Indian startups actually attracted record capital. $38 billion was just invested in 2021, which is three times what was invested in 2022, sorry, 2020. So uh, you, you're seeing this whole scale up of opportunities and capital being invested in these opportunities. And I think for to contrast what you just said there about unicorns, there were 42 that were minted in, in India in 2021. And that's when a seed investor invests at the seed level and, and the, that that startup becomes worth a, a billion dollars or more. By contrast, in the United States in 2021, there were 320. So about one eighth. Yes. And we're, we're seeing the capital from U.S. markets and other places around the world going to other places where capital has been constrained and there are fantastic opportunities. Can you talk more about that, shed more light about that, about what's happening there in India? So, you know, as, as investors, we look for inefficiency because greater the inefficiency, larger the opportunity. And, and India, as you know, has uh, very significant inefficiencies, whether it's our, our, our financial system, whether it's our health cash system, whether it's insurance india has amongst the lowest penetration of insurance healthcare many of these traditional industries that you've seen scale very well and become large part of gdps around the world so and and i think one of the biggest leveler is technology right it it breaks all barriers as long as you can build a product that a consumer is willing to pay for it doesn't matter where you are what your scale, size, et cetera, is the customer is willing to pay because their need is being met. In India, we're seeing transformation being led in each of these sectors. So today, you know, in India, if you just take financial services as a sector, you said you, you came from there, you're still one of the leaders in that space. I, India is leading the innovation around different aspects of financial services. So let's just take payments, right? So India is one of those countries where uh, a large number of transactions now happen digitally, $300 billion worth of transactions happen digitally. And the simplicity and ease with which you can now transact has, has dramatically shifted, right? Just five years ago, everything was happening through physical checks. And today it's scan a QR code and just pay. And even settlements across large amounts, business payments, everything happens real time at the end of day settlement. So the transformation that has been significant and that's unlocked a lot of value for businesses as well as consumers, right? So it's made life of consumers much easier. It's taken friction away, saved them a lot of time and often costs because 
the inefficiency often is paid for by the customer, whether the customer is the consumer or the business. Uh, so technology today, by bringing about these changes, is unlocking a lot of value. And uh, we as investors are very excited about the shift that we're seeing, and you know we're getting an opportunity to participate in many of these shifts. There are companies in our portfolio that have really uh, led this change and shift. And as awful as the pandemic has been, I'll, I would bet that it also has facilitated the necessity of additional adoption of technology, technical solutions with this terrible disease and trying to eliminate human contact. I bet that was an acceleration. I know it was here in the U.S. I'm sure it was an acceleration of technology adoption in India as well. Can you comment on that? Yes. So there has been significant human cost of this pandemic, and we've all uh, been touched by it. We've all lost someone that we know, love, and care about. And you know, I'm, I'm often saddened when I think of that. The impact on the businesses, like you said, has been profound. And some of this impact has very high stickiness. It's unlikely that we go back to our old ways of doing things, right? So for all of us, now work from home isn't as alien as a concept as it used to be just three years ago. S similar impact has happened in terms of our day-to-day -day interactions, engagements. It's also happened from what our customers expect from, from us. So I think our portfolio, which is more focused on B2B businesses, was in part sheltered from the disruption from a cash standpoint because they don't burn a lot of cash to sustain. But on the adoption side, we've seen much greater adoption, far shorter sales cycles. We, we have customers that are now are very eager to partner with our portfolio companies for the products and services that they offer. And, and this is not just limited to enterprise SaaS-like solutions. It's, it's across the spectrum, right? So today, we know if, if, you wanted, if you ran a real estate company, it's easier to manage it, manage the construction business in your real estate business through drones than having field force. It's easier to have uh, digital health delivery than you know, the physical infrastructure that existed. And the way you can scale healthcare using digital solutions is uh, something that we've discovered in the last two years and is now transforming how healthcare delivery happens across. Tell me what GrowX does as a business, what you do day to day. How does, how does GrowX add value in the deal chain for finding seed investors? How do you grow them? How do you add value to them? Why don't you just describe all of that and how that works? A large part of our day goes into two sets of activities. Right? One is just deal evaluation. The other is engaging with our portfolio companies. On deal evaluation, our approach is two-pronged. One is proactive, which is thesis-led. So we spend some part of our time uh, every quarter thinking through what are the sectors that are of keen interest to us. And once we've identified those sectors, we make an active outreach. This outreach may happen through partners like uh, large tech colleges, institutions. It could happen through accelerators with whom we run a curated program inviting startups and entrepreneurs to come build businesses within our thesis areas or present ideas that they think fit that thesis. Or it could just be LinkedIn-led, you know, just announce that this is our thesis and come talk to us if you're interested. And the second part of that deal sourcing, deal evaluation is uh, reactive, which is people reaching out to us with their ideas, us evaluating the idea on its merit and then responding and engaging with them. Once we see an idea that falls within our thesis, the market looks large enough, the founding team looks strong to build this business. And if uh, they succeed, this idea could be very valuable and scale very rapidly. Then we build, not only do we invest in that business, but we build an infrastructure around them. We, we bring in subject matter experts for the, that industry. You know, one of the things that we've learned in our life is that we don't know everything and we all need a little bit of help. So we identify specific areas where we can source that help for these founding companies, start, uh, founders and founding teams, and then build that infrastructure around them. The second part of assistance that we provide and 
to our portfolio companies is in um, helping them reach out to customers, potential customers. That's uh, one of the key reasons why we focus on B2B businesses because we have a network, we have potential customers that we know for many of these businesses, and we can at least put the business idea in front of a decision maker. And if, if the founder has a solution that meets an urgent pressing need, then at least the decision process can be cut short and they can have their first few clients, which in an early stage company changes the trajectory of that company. So that's another thing. The third thing that we do for these companies is often act as the third co-founder, fourth co-founder, largely focused on the fundraising efforts. Uh, so we build relationships with late stage VCs. And as these companies mature, uh, we continue to showcase them to some of the larger VCs from Sequoia to Alpha Wave to Tiger to many of the large global funds are now active in India. And we have relationships with most, if not all of them. So that becomes the final area of our engagement with these companies. In addition to that, you know, obviously we've all built businesses ourselves. So uh, we're familiar with some of the challenges that a company goes through as it starts to build its business. And we're always available as a thought partner, as a as someone you can bounce your ideas off and, and leverage to problem solve. And these businesses that you make these seed investments in, <clears throat> what percentage of them are in India and what percentage of them are in the U.S. and elsewhere? So, you know, uh, we, we only invest in businesses which are targeting the Indian market or are, lev are, are domiciled in India, building products for the global market. So we've invested now in 16 companies some of them have chosen to domicile themselves outside India. Many of them prefer U.S. as a destination. So one of our uh, portfolio companies is called Pixel, which is building this constellation of hyperspectral imagery satellites. And U.S. is a much better market to uh, source investors and expertise for a business like that. So the founding team is in India. The large operation is in India. They're in close partnership with India's space organization, ISRO, but they're domiciled, the company's domiciled in the US. And then we've got businesses like Zuddle, which is a digital events company where the team is still in India, but the product's value it will largely be for more developed countries. So the founding team has relocated from India to the US to make sure they're closer to their customer, understand their needs better, and serve to, to you know, grow that business rapidly. They built a large sales force, sales engine in the US. So take us through kind of the life cycle of a seed investment. You guys build your due diligence process, decide you're going to make an investment, make a seed investment. How long does it take before they get to a series A investment and then a series B investment and series C and then an exit? Like give us the 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 prototypical life cycle of a deal and then how you guys get in and how you get out so you know um, our first investment was a fintech called procap we invested in this company in 2019 and typically you would expect 12 months give or take a couple of months for a series a to happen procap was an exception where it saw series a happen in nine months but most portfolio companies we expect 12 months, give or take a couple of months for Series A. And from there on, once it's raised enough capital to build on its product and continue to develop product market fit, you'd see another 12 to 18 months to the next round, which is Series B. Typically in B2B businesses, Series B rounds are attractive rounds, but it is the Series C where value really gets unlocked for us as investors. And we see very large multiples. You know, If, if the business succeeds to raise the CDC in another 18 months, so now you're talking roughly about four years, then you could expect north of 25 times multiples on your investment. Our exit strategy is to opportunistically start looking at companies at CDC onwards to find exit opportunities. The exit would come either when they do a new round of financing and then incoming investor wants greater ownership in the business without diluting the founders too much. At that point, uh, buying out existing investors becomes an attractive proposition for all. The alternative to that is that some of the existing investors may want to 
over time increase their ownership in the business. And every time new price is discovered, it gives us an opportunity to revalue our equity and have an interesting conversation with existing investors to see, seek interest in our ownership. PropCap, like I said, today is doing exceptionally well. You know, it has an exceptional set of investors from Sequoia to Tiger Global to Creations Capital and a few others. They've just wrapped up their CDC. I think we, we're still holding on to our investment. We've been very fortunate with PropCap because that alone is going to give us a multiple of our fund and, and we'll be able to do right by investors that took a leap of faith with us early on when we started. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the risks of investing in seed investments. You guys like to do it in a fund because there is mortality, right? There are there can be great ideas that have a great path and a great idea and a great management team. And sometimes, you know, there has to be a little luck involved sometimes that it just could be the wrong timing. It could be all kinds of things that could make it be go awry. Talk to us about mortality rates at seed investments where a company goes to zero and the the ways to mitigate those those risks. You know, so if you look at just the whole startup ecosystem across B2C and B2B businesses, the mortality between seed to series A is amongst the highest, right? So you, you could easily see 40 to 45% businesses just perish at the seed stage to series A stage. Often some businesses are able to raise a bridge round or a small series A round and then move forward. But even at series A where you've raised, if you've been successful in raising a large pool of capital, you're still discovering product market fit. You're still figuring out if this business, if this market is large enough, if there are enough consumers that need my product. I may have onboarded a few early adopters, but that doesn't mean I'd be able to build a successful business. And at the other end of the spectrum, the founding team starts to get tested for execution skills, right? Often people who have great ideas are able to build great tech, may not necessarily be able to execute uh, at an operational level and scale the business. So that's where the mortality uh, is high between series A and series B. Series B onwards, mortality typically drops. So between I think seed to series B, you'd see about 70% of companies drop out. And, and in B2C businesses, that could even be as high as uh, 80, 85% companies uh, between C to series B drop off. What survives from there on could potentially become large. That being said, you know, there are still often large circumstances, situations, events like pandemic, which which could come in and disrupt the businesses and that's a risk that you always carry in a seed stage com- uh, in an early stage company because the pool of capital available to weather such storms is always finite and whatever remains out of that can then become very large like we said those are the ones that achieve the unicorn decacon status well fantastic manu i appreciate you spending the time with us today lots more to cover here but we we're, we're we try to keep these podcasts around 30 minutes. Well, why don't you uh, give us a closing thought and we'll have Eric take us out. Thank you, Derek. And, you know, my parting thought is that we do live in very interesting times where technology is changing our lives uh, at a pace that is unforeseen, unexpected, and and unparalleled. We are going to see new innov- new businesses being innovated, new technology being created, And that's both at the consumer as well as at a business level. And and we're in for the ride of our lives. Well, fantastic. We're going to count on you to continue to fetter out those ideas and bring those best ideas forward and that are investable and uh, can uh, bring those ideas to investors that are hungry for, for those kind of opportunities. So thank you very much for spending your time with us today. Eric? Thank you for producing the show today. Why don't you take us out? Absolutely. Manu, again, thank you so much for being here. Uh, You're a great guest again. And of course, Derek, thank you so much for bringing him on the show. You always bring great information to the audience. I I don't want to end, though, just here. Derek, every guest that you bring on makes people have questions, right? They, it, it puts thoughts in their mind. Oh, okay, well, this, this sounds interesting. And they may want to follow up. So can you give them some contact information that where they can follow up with you guys and, and have a conversation? Absolutely. So 
my go to our website at uh, centurawealth.com. That's C E N T U R A wealth.com. And all of our contact information is there. You can email or our phone number's there. And uh, love to have a chat with you if you're interested. Absolutely. Again, guys, thank you so much for the podcast today. Great information. And our last thank you always goes to you listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Live Life Liberated podcast with the team from Centura Wealth Advisory. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when they come out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it really easy to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at Centura Wealth Advisory, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Live Life Liberated podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Centura Wealth Advisory. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Centura Wealth Advisory, Centura, is an SEC registered investment advisor with its principal place of business in San Diego, California. Centura and its representatives are in compliance with the current registration and notice filing requirements imposed on SEC registered investment advisors, in which Centura maintains clients. Centura may only transact business in those states in which it is notice filed or qualifies for an exemption or exclusion from notice filing requirements. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Tax relief varies based on client circumstances and all clients do not achieve the same results. 